welcome to Flywheel, um, October 2021 Flywheel. Hi, my name is Yanni Krolz, and I'm really pleased to be your host this evening. Um, we have two writers with us tonight, uh, Rona Altros and Molly Cross Blanchard, um, coming from Calgary and from Vancouver, Molly. Uh, we have Mike, my partner, uh, doing all the behind the scenes work um, downstairs. <laughs> and uh, so thank you to Mike for handling all the tech stuff. Uh, you are being recorded right now. So um, just to note, um, you can also uh, watch all of the uh, past uh, flywheel readings online on our Facebook page. Um, and this is actually our one year anniversary of being online. So we have done this for a year now and uh, we'll, we'll continue to do so um, for our safety, I suppose. <laughs> and, and hopefully um, we'll, we'll be uh, joining everyone in person um, in the near future. So a shout out to Pages Books, uh, our non-pandemic host. Um, you can get these authors' books at Pages. It's a fantastic bookstore here in Kensington in Calgary. And I encourage you, if you're not living in, in Calgary, to, um, you know, check out your local bookstore. Uh, they're a really important uh, resource for uh, literary arts in Canada, and they do really good work. Also, check out our partner, Filling Station Magazine. You can subscribe at fillingstation.ca, and you can also like our page, uh, Flywheel Reading Series. Um, if you're watching this on Facebook Live, share um, share a video. We're also on um, Instagram and, and Twitter. I'd like to also say um, a big thank you for the generous financial support of the Writers Union of Canada and the Canada Council for the Arts. Um, thank you for supporting this reading. And um, before we, be we begin, uh, while we are meeting virtually, um, for those of us in Calgary, Mokinsis, I would like to say uh, we would like to acknowledge the traditional territories and oral practices of the Blackfoot nations, which includes the Siksika, the Pikani, and the Kanai. We also acknowledge the Sarsi Dene or of Sutina and the Stony Nakoda of Morley, which includes Bearspaw, Chiniki, Wesley Nakoda First Nations, the Métis Nation Region 3, and all people who make their homes in the Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta. So our first reader of the evening is Rona Altros. Rona Altros is a multi-genre writer, editor, anthologist, and playwright with a passion for voice. She has co-edited or edited three anthologies. The most recent, You Look Good for Your Age, features work by 29 writers who identify as female and give their takes on aging and ageism. She is the author of three books of short fiction and a children's book. Her short stories and essays have also been published widely in magazines in print and online, most recently in the Queen's Quarterly. Her 10 minute plays have been produced in Alberta, Hawaii and Connecticut. And she is a co-founder with Ethan Cole and Lisa Murphy Lamb of the 10 minute play festival, Gimme 10 Minutes. Her awards include the W.O. Mitchell Book Prize for A Run on Hose and the John White Memorial Essay Award. Please welcome Rona Altros. Oh, and just make sure you un unmute, Rona. Oh, there we go. Thank you, Yanni. It works, things work better when you turn them on, I guess. <laughs> um, well, I, I, I would like to start with, with, uh, with, with, with uh, thanking some specific people, starting with Yanni Krultz, who has uh, put up their many questions from me in the last several days and has shown great patience in answering all of them um, fully and graciously. Um, uh, to Mike Jones for handling all the tech today. Um, to Amy LeBlanc, the managing editor of Filling Station Magazine, to the Flywheel Reading Series of which we're a part and which is the yeah, child of the magazine. Um, to uh, the camera this off. Is press. I, I'm hearing something in the background. Is there somebody else who's unmuted or? 
Sorry, I think it was me, and I'm about to mute myself. Awkward. Rona, I think you're also muted now. <laughs> Sorry. The joys of online living. Uh, yes, life online. <laughs> Um, okay, uh, so I was busy thanking people. I think the last person I thanked was Amy, Le Amy LeBlanc, who's the managing editor of um, a Filling Station, the magazine that is the parent of this reading series, the Flywheel Reading Series. Um, I would like to thank uh, Thistledown Press and Prairie Fire Magazine, where Aron and Hose, um, well, uh, Thistledown published Aron and Hose, but a few years prior to that, Prairie Fire published Amanda's Weekend, from which I will read today. Um, Alberta Views Magazine, which first published The Shave, from which I will also read today, and University of Alberta Press, which published You Look Good for Your Age, which just came out. Um, so I, I, I would like to um, kind of celebrate with you today the fact that um, some of us, uh, we, e even though we may leave our fictional friends for a while, um, we, it's not as if we don't care about them or think about them, we do. And at least speaking for myself, I can tell you, I'm often wondering what um, they are up to. Even if I haven't written, even if I haven't um, had a conversation with them for a while, um, even if they haven't found themselves into a, in a story of mine for a while, I still think of them. So today I wanna to talk about Amanda. Um, Amanda first um, uh, presented herself to me in the late 1990s. And then um, the story Amanda's Weekend appeared in Prairie Fire Magazine in 2001. And then later in my first book, A Run on Hose, that came out in 2007. It took me about uh, 13 years of writing before I, uh, I was able to get a book out. But that, that is a different story. Um, and then um, to my great surprise, Sometime in 2018, Amanda kind of knocked on my head and said, hey, I, you know, I have been living my life and I'm a lot older now and I, I, I have something to say here. And so in 2019, um, Amanda appeared in the story The Shade in Alberta Views magazine. And Amanda presents herself again in the anthology, uh, You Look Good for Your Age, that just came out. Um, so there you go. Um, she and I um, have both uh, grown older and um, we, we have both uh, gone places mentally and I guess to some extent physically. And um, you're gonna hear a little bit about that right now. So the first story from which I'll read, Amanda's Weekend, um, is from a run on hose. And it takes place in the late 1960s when Amanda, who's from New York, um, is um, living in Montreal, going to McGill. Um, it, it's a story that takes place in the course of a weekend. There are three sections, Friday night, Saturday afternoon, and Sunday evening and um, in the course of the story, Amanda is uh, sleeps with three different guys while thinking about a fourth. <laughs> so here we are, Amanda's weekend, I'll read you a little bit of Friday night. Amanda hasn't known David long, 
but the fact that he belongs to a communist cell arouses her. He tells her that the members of his cell study Marx, but do not get involved in political activity because action leads to compromise and compromise leads to corruption. What drives you then, she asks, and he says, purity of intent. Amanda has to know what motivates a person. She has learned that the best place to find out is in bed. It's good to have David in bed tonight. He is a bookish boy, and tonight he looks especially pale and reflective. It's as though she were sleeping with a cloistered monk, another idea that arouses her. She herself is reclusive, the reincarnation, she believes, of a medieval religious scribe. She takes quiet pleasure in hand copying striking passages from books. She and David are like brothers sharing the moment. Besides, his dedication to inertia contrasts nicely with Kevin's agitation. She is tired of rallies, tired of the rants against the sinister military industrial complex of the United States and its war of aggression in Vietnam. She is tired of worrying what will become of Kevin and her brothers and all her male friends of draftable age back home in New York. It's less aggravating up here in Canada. She chose to apply to Canadian universities and was relieved when McGill accepted her. The separation from Kevin is hard, but she feels she needs it. She gets together with him every couple of months on visits home. Typically, they spend a couple of days in bed. Then she sees her family and heads back up to Montreal while Kevin returns to his anti-war work on the Columbia campus. Sometimes Kevin becomes consumed with one female activist or another. Amanda knows this because in the interest of maintaining a completely honest relationship, he tells her everything. Amanda herself does not believe in carrying candor to the point of cruelty. She does not intend to tell him about her intimacy with David tonight, for instance. Kevin has enough to deal with already, especially since last week when an overzealous New York cop cracked his jaw open at a demonstration. Her brother, monk David, deftly stimulates her clitoris with his index finger. As they play, she thinks about her pre-Kevin life when she didn't have to weigh or compare or cover up or make excuses. So then Amanda's life goes on and the writer's life goes on. And Amanda presents herself again quite a few years later when she's in her 60s in the shave. And um, I'll read you a bit from the opening of the shave. After Paul's funeral, Amanda decided to shave off what was left of her pubic hair. Already some strands had rayed, some had gone brittle bald patches had shown up, enough. In his own way, David Attenborough encouraged her to go ahead with the shave. Attenborough always calmed her. His voice, gravelly yet kind, that spoke of a long lifetime of observation, wonderment, continuous gathering of knowledge of the natural world. The way he pronounced glacier, glacier. The way he made creatures of the tundra, the desert, the circumpolar boreal forest seem human or better 
as they lived out their stories of lucky flukes, sacrifices for their young, fatal mistakes. During this period of what was supposed to be grief, but actually was limbo, marked by a numbness she didn't mind as a temporary state, since it buffered her from unwanted intrusions. She watched an Attenborough special on oceans. King penguins waddled across her screen and plunked themselves down on hard ground, trapped in the torment of a growing itch. Amanda watched a penguin peck at itself relentlessly until it had removed every feather in each of its four layers, the outer oily layer and the three layers of down. And in plucking off the feathers, the king penguin got rid of thousands of parasites picked up during its hunting forays at sea. This, Attenborough explained, was called the catastrophic molt. Amanda felt an immediate affinity with the naked bird. The king penguin stood exposed and vulnerable to predators, starving, surviving only on body fat until every feather was replaced. Then restored to its capacity and power, it could again live fully. Amanda had never before given herself a pubic shave and was unsure what instrument would be optimal. A specially designed razor. All she had was a Gillette Venus still pristine in its packaging, although she had bought it months earlier. She had intended to use the razor the next time she shaved her underarms, something she hardly had to do anymore. That was how slowly the hairs grew. It was the same for her leg hairs. She had forgotten all about the Venus until this moment. Possibly in using it, she would not be following best practices. But it was what she had, and it would have to do. She had been shaved by a nurse 30 years before while in labor with Sophie. Although Amanda's hypersensitive skin had not been cut. She had developed an excoriated rash, which she attributed to the hospital's chemically scented shaving cream. This time she would go with aloe vera. She decided to soak in the tub, get the area loosened up before moving in with the razor. A bath on the maternity ward would have been divine three decades back, although she had read recently that bathing slowed labor, so perhaps not. At the very least, she would have appreciated low lighting as she had learned about in her prenatal classes, which Paul had rarely attended with her. What was the name of that French obstetrician they had taught her and her pregnant classmates about the one who promoted gentle birthing methods. Le something. Le sage, politician. Le blanc, writer. However, back to the shave. It was not as tricky as she anticipated. True, she did not work with the panache of the king of Canaan, but she was careful and thorough. She tried using a makeup mirror, but could not get the angles right, abandoned it, continued by feel alone. A rinse left the skin soft, pores happy, and no nicks. What did the shave mean? Amanda was not sure. She re regretted not having read Jung. She wanted to talk to Sophie about the shave, but decided against it. Since Paul's final illness, Sophie had been extraordinarily protective of her. Maybe it was too early in Amanda's life for this to be happening. After all, she was in fairly good condition for a woman in her, in her 60s. 
She did not need to be mothered by her daughter, at least not yet. Still, she let Sophie hug her a lot and call her every day to check in, make sure she ate. She would not thwart Sophie's over solicitousness for now, since it seemed to be part of what her daughter needed as she processed her father's death. Amanda knew instinctively that if she told Sophie about the shade, her daughter would find a way to turn it into a problem, the sign of a sinister turn in her mother's mental health. But still, she was sorely tempted to share news of the shade with Sophie, because Sophie had read Jung. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rona. That was fantastic. Okay. Thank you. Um, all right, we'll go on to um, Molly. Molly Cross Blanchard is a white and Métis writer living on the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil peoples, aka Vancouver, where she works as a publisher of Room Magazine. Her de debut collection of po poetry is Exhibitionist, published by Coach House Books uh, 2021. Please welcome Molly. Thank you so much, Yanni. Um, and thank you, Rona, for your reading. That was so funny and tender and um, I'm really grateful to be um, on the bill with you and I'm looking forward to our chat after as well. Um, yes, so thanks for the introduction. My name is Molly Cross Blanchard um, and I am streaming from Vancouver, uh, but I'm a prairie girl at heart. I was uh, raised in Northern Saskatchewan, uh, Prince Albert. Um, so I, I wish I was there with you on the prairies in person. Um, that would be really lovely, but thanks to the folks that have their, their cameras on because it feels um, very warm to be able to look at your faces uh, during a reading, which is not always the case anymore. Um, so I'm going to read from my new book, Exhibitionist. This was published with um, Coach House Books in April of 2021. Um, this really gorgeous cover art was done by Mally Fisher Levine. Uh, you can find her on Instagram and she's got a website as well and tons of really um, amazing work on there. Um, so I'm going to dive right in with the poem that I often start with, which is the title poem in the book and the first poem of the book uh, called Exhibitionist. Exhibitionist. The most orgasms I ever had in one go come over Christmas vacation in my childhood basement bedroom. Door cracked open, sheets peeled back, pussy in plain view of the cat clawing carpet. Is this how flashers feel in their trench coats and chest hair? I'd like to sit in the park with my thumb stuck up my nose and wait for someone to notice. I want to be more like the woman in Burger King who eats fries straight off the floor. The woman who cries in Walmart when her preteen son says, fuck you, mom, for the first time in front of the greeter yanking carts. At the strip club, I eat onion rings, watch the dancer watching me from upside down in her halo of light. When will my roommate notice the way I air dry underwear on the corner of the hallway mirror, symbol of sex in his reflection? I want to feel like a display model lipstick. Dug at nubs smeared across the mouths of strangers, a much handled sample of the real thing. Granville Island. Look at the wide sky. Now look at me. Are you ashamed to be seen with a woman in pigtails? My tits are trapped under spandex today because last night I pressed my bare ass against your back and you slept on and on. Then a ghost baby with all your hair hovered there between us. So I sang the saddest songs I knew till it fell off the edge of the bed and tumbled out the open window into traffic. I feel impotent. You say over dinner while I cry discreetly into the scallops. I want to tell you I don't love you either but you did it first, so that makes me spurned. Is this romance, brine, an embarrassment, your thumb back and forth on my wrist? Shit, I'm sorry I wore my hair like this. You have to keep looking up at a woman in pigtails who you don't love, and that's no fun. Should I go? 
ask the sky to swallow me whole, we'll pretend this never happened. It's cool. I never wanted a body without your baby in it. I never wanted a baby without your body next to mine. You have two girlfriends. You have two girlfriends and I have McMuffin wrappers on my windowsill. You have two girlfriends and I'm in the bath plucking hairs from my nipples with my teeth. Fuck you if that turned you on. You have two girlfriends on my birthday. It's my birthday and I'm eating a bloody steak at my desk with a plastic knife turned away from the one where Rachel finds out. I found out you have two girlfriends on my birthday. I'm 25 and smelling the crotch of all my jeans. I'm 25 in a basement suite with rats that scratch in the walls at night and a coin off washer dryer. I try to shove three weeks of clothes in at a time. Instagram says your new condo building is round, overlooks the river walk, and you've got a chaise lounge for each of your girlfriends. I've got a slipper for each of my feet and I swish swish haunt this place. It's so hard to live in the world. I give, my wor I give the world my body and the world gives me insomnia and meetings in pubs where I buy my own beer. I'm only here because my face is white and my grandpa sells furnaces to all of America. I keep FaceTiming my friends so I can cry. I didn't come up with that myself. Everyone on Twitter is smarter than me. I'm the only one who thinks I'm fat and it's ruining every day. I don't walk my dog enough. It's my fault she bit the Pomeranian. I like Brussels sprouts, I'm just not eating them. I bought some iron pills, they're still in the plastic. I followed all the hot fat girls on Instagram, but still I grab handfuls of my tummy like, fuck you. How many more days can I ignore the urgent email before I'm fired? How many can I spend staring at the philodendron before I water it? I love when someone suffers because then I can help them. No one is helping me through this suffering except mom, but duh, she doesn't count. Well, actually, maybe they're trying to help me and I'm saying, no, thank you. I don't want to go for ice cream tonight. It's been raining and raining, so I slink to the window and picture this. Mom pulls up in the Buick. I sprawl across the back seat and leave everything behind, even the books. On the prairie, I play Paper Mario in the basement for hours while Reese feeds me the crusts from her grilled cheeses. And when she's at school, I lie on the trampoline watching the bird feeder I made in freshman shop class. No birds come, but I've given the world my body and the world has given it a rest. And this last poem I'm going to read is a bit of a longer one and it's called, This is a Poem I've Fashioned. Um, thank you again, um, Yanni. Thanks to Mike. Thanks Rona and Amy. Um, I'm really, really happy to be um, here tonight reading for you. This is a poem I fashioned from a journal entry. Sorry. I was hysterical one night. The moon was being weird. I sent you nudes that made my ass look rounder than it is and wrote, I think we should have sex when I'm in town. I put a deposit down on a hand tattoo that Kyle says will make me look like I've been to prison. I ate half a vegan bean wrap and a piece of cheese toast and two cups of sweet beige coffee and that's it. I took a pissing selfie and posted it in the ladies fitness accountability chat, hashtag multitasking. No one liked it. Is this what feeling my whole life is like, is what I wrote in the journal. I'd been watching Fleabag, that was the problem. Phoebe Waller-Bridge and the moon. I reminded myself that my mother and my best friend are alive. I reminded myself I have a dog, not a guinea pig. She licked my hand over and over and I had to lie still for a while. I read some Sally Rooney and just like that, the banana peel drying on the desk became endearing. I was endeared to myself, but now I can't remember how. Recalling drunkenness, sober. I need you to love me more than I need to remember liking myself and I'm only a little embarrassed to admit it. I hope you like my body when we fuck. I hope you say my asshole tastes like caramel again. I never forgot that.
And I hope my asshole actually tastes like caramel and you weren't just saying it to make me feel better about having a regular tasting asshole. If you haven't missed my breasts, you will after you see them in these new sheer cups. You'll miss them while they're still in your hands. All of it happened so fast. I just wanted to feel loved again by a man who loves me, to be held so normal while it's dark outside. And I wanted to smell you. This is the present tense. I want to lick your warm neck and smell that magic thing my spit does on your skin. Love really looks like this, huh? This is the transition. I'm climbing a hill or else descending quickly into a tumble. If I'm a baby's light up toy, you are the blinking default setting. I have to be loving someone else to not be loving you. What we thought was a pressed red self-destruct button is actually hundreds of windows to be nailed shut by hand. Do you understand? This coming together is part of the leaving. Sorry. Just fuck me like you did at Disney World. I swear I'll be right there with you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Molly. That was wonderful. All right. So um, I have some questions for these two writers. Um, if you uh, do you have questions um, in the audience here on Zoom? You can type them in to the little chat box. Um, we'll monitor them. We also have links for, uh, for Molly and for Rona. Um, so if you want to check them out online, um, you can just click on the link and um, take you right there. So my first question um, for both of you, it's the same question really. Um, it, when I was reading your books, it struck me that you're even though these, I mean, and I'm talking uh, Rona about um, you look good for your age, the anthology, but uh, specifically that that story, the shave um, that you that you read from, um, and and Molly, your your book as well. When I was reading them, it struck me that um, you're dealing with similar subject matter in a way. Like it's not uh, completely obvious <laughs> at first glance, but then when I went through them, I was like, oh, this is really interesting. Um, you both write about the body in, in, in a kind of subversive way. And um, so for example, I don't think like culturally, we, we don't think a lot um, or collectively about the aging naked female body. Um, and Rona, that is one of the first images that you present in that story, The Shave. And then uh, Molly, your speaker, is a young woman, and of course, um, young women are the subject of relentless attention, but the way that you present sexuality and, and nudity um, is, is rather unflinching, and it has, in my mind, little to do with the male gaze, uh, is kind of resisting that. So I'm, I'm curious about how you both think of the body and how you approach it in your writing, so... Molly, if you'd like to go first, you're out right there. Sure. Um, yeah, I love this question. Actually, I think Rona, Rona's work and my work have a, a lot in common, like very much um, on the surface, it feels that way. Um, in the, the, like you said, sort of the frankness or the, um, um, the sort of matter of fact way that the body is presented rather than sort of this beat around the bush, no pun intended kind of, kind of thing. Um, but with um, exhibitionist in particular, um, I was I was thinking about the body as sort of an extension of the self that holds all of the self's shame. Like that seems to be where a lot of women um, hold their shame is is in their body, um, whether that be you know what size our body is or the things our body does, like grow hair or fart or poop um, or um, like how sexually active or inactive our bodies are um, or how much pleasure they are or aren't experiencing. So I think what I've tried to do in writing very frankly about my own body is to take some of that power away from the people and institutions who believe that, you know, a woman's body is um, implicitly impolite or gross or prudish or slutty um, and presented in a way that you know, the only person who can have opinions about it is me. Um, and I'm not always completely kind to, to my body in the book. Um, but that's just, you know, being honest, because when you've been fed 
all of these really arbitrary beauty standards and kind of bullshit femininity for, you know, your entire life, it takes a toll. Um, so I hope that's been sort of laid bare in the book that, um, you know, we love our bodies, but sometimes we hate them. And that's just sort of the, the struggle. Thank you. Um, and Rona. Well, I think I'm gonna just begin by saying, um, wow, I really loved your reading, <laughs> Molly. That was so fabulous. There is uh, so much uh, going on there. That is very complex work and um, um, such natural humor, you know? There's nothing more um, that makes a person feel more alive than natural humor. And nothing that makes a person want to slit her throat more than forced humor. And there's no forced humor over there. It all just comes out, you know, naturally. Um, and um, I think that does tie in with, with the question uh, too, Yai, yeah, is that what, I, what I'd like to say is that I, I, I too feel that there is, in fact, I felt this last night when I was reading uh, some of Molly's work online. I thought there, there is a, a true affinity between um, her work and mine um, in as much as we uh, approach the, the human body and, and maybe in, in particular the female body um, in, a, in a kind of, uh, unromantic way, if you like. Um, and it, it, it's a, a, a kind of demythologizing that we do through our work. And I, and I think you can't really do that in poetry or fiction completely consciously maybe, but um, that when, when, you, when you read it yourself and you realize that that was, um, actually your intent. So um, I, I would also say that um, young women and older women um, face many of the same problems in as much as uh, they are subjected to uh, astonishing and quite um, uh, sort of intellect defying um, expectations uh, socially in terms of how they're supposed supposed to look and how they're supposed to uh, project their their physicality and um, so uh, so I do think that um, for those reasons I I would think that uh, Amanda, either in her uh, as as she, in her younger years or Amanda today, would uh, get along quite well with the persona in your poems, Molly. As do I. <laughs> That's my answer, um, Rona. What what you say about that kind of. Um shared experience that was going to lead that leads to my second question which is like neither group the young women and or older women old women i don't even know how to how to you know phrase that it's like not a very uh flattering term like young women old women um i'm wondering is our perception of these groups or their experience changing is that cha is that um, it, when we think about it, the cultural context of like me, the Me Too movement, um, body, body positivity movement, like is there change? Um, is there a shift? Is that, what, what do you think? I know that's kind of a broad question, but. No, it's a good question. Uh, yeah, it's broad, that's okay. Broad questions are good, they make us think. You wanna go, Molly? I have ideas, but I wanna hear yours. Sure. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, when you so you sort of gave us this question ahead of time, and you had mentioned, you know, is it is it the Me Too movement? Is it the pandemic? Like, are these things sort of acting as like catalysts towards um, taking women more seriously? Um, so I thought about that a lot this afternoon, and um, I kept coming back to we've always taken our ourselves seriously. Like, I feel like um, that isn't really changing, but it's almost become. Um, it's become less acceptable to, to um, discount the work of women or discount women's lives um, sort of outwardly, outwardly, like it's not popular anymore. <laughs> and I think, honestly, I think the Me Too movement has had a lot to do with that. I think it really accelerated um, that mindset, um, but still that, that sort of serious regard seems to be reserved for like cis white women because there is still this um, almost like this like institutional distrust of or contempt for um, women of color <laughs> and, and trans women. Um, and even looking at like, so I work as the publisher at Room Magazine, which is like a, a long, long standing feminist magazine, but looking at the history of who has been published in Room, who has been at the helm of it, even up to like 10 years ago, um, predominantly cis white women. Um, so that's something we're trying to, of course, correct um, by, you know, not just being equitable for those marginalized groups, but like being massive supporters and sort of like screaming their accomplishments um, and brilliance from the rooftops, um, which is still rare, like maybe not in our, you know, we're in this sort of like literary microcosm where it just feels like um, we're light years sort of ahead in terms of social justice and um, representation, but I think in the grand scheme of things, like there are very few organizations who are doing that kind of um, work that is still really necessary. So, I mean, my answer is twofold in that, yes, I, I think we've come a really long way, but also um, there's a ton of work to be done in, in sort of other aspects outside of like white feminism or what sort of is pop popular feminism. Ah! Oh, sorry, dog. <laughs> Rona, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, well, I was listening very, very closely <laughs> to, to Molly, so I, I wouldn't mind if you repeated the question. <laughs> I'm just wondering if um, uh, you see any shifts or any possibility of shifts, right. of shifts in, in this current moment, given the pandemic, um, the, uh, what had I said, the Me Too movement, body positivity movement, um, wh what is right. changing? Um, you know, I, I think uh, change is occurring, but I think that it would be disingenuous for us to pretend that, um, you know, that uh, ageism is separate from sexism, is separate from racism. I mean, uh, one thing I really, I don't, I'm not really uh, big on the word intersectionality. I find it to be a very clumsy word and hard to pronounce. However, I, th I really love the concept. And um, if somebody could come up for a with a better word than intersectionality for intersectionality, please do it because I really love the idea. And, and it, it, there's no question that these things are, are all almost inextricably wound together. Um, I, I, st I still think that um, cis white, males um, occupy too prominent a place in society in general. I'm not con as convinced as, I, I mean, I may maybe um, <clears throat> I don't feel quite as positive as Molly does about how advanced we are in the literary world because I see a hell of a lot of bullshit in the literary world and a lot of sexism, a lot of ageism. So I don't think we're that much better. I think we express ourselves better, maybe, sometimes. Um, but, you know, I've seen a lot of uh, well-written ageist, sexist, racist columns by 
cis white men, um, which are, you know, very well written. So, <laughs> so um, they're very well written, but it's still the same crap, right? Um, and I do think that Me Too has been helpful in as much as um, it, it, it's given people, um, uh, it, it's encouraged people uh, to, to have the courage to speak out. And I do think also that um, kind of as part of that and, and maybe less visibly, um, the organizations that help uh, people through um, sexual harassment and sexual assault experiences, a lot of these organizations are really fantastic and very sophisticated and humane and compassionate in the way they do their work. And if I may be permitted to speak plainly, or even if I may not, I would say that um, the goddamn legal system and judicial system could have learned a lot, sorry, if they just spent one day at a women's center, one day. Send an old male white cis judge into a women's center for one day. And that guy will learn a lot about how you talk to people in a respectful way, how, you know, I, I mean, part of the problem too is that we have this adversarial legal system which does nobody any good, nobody at all. Um, anyway, I feel that I'm digressing a little bit maybe, uh, but, 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 but what I, what I, what I mean to say is that I think all these things have um, definitely are, that there's a lot of, a lot of push, a lot of impetus in, in the, in the correct direction now, which is the, the, the direction of social justice and fairness. But we're not there. No, we got a long way to go. Yeah, thanks for that answer. I feel like I also want to add, like, I agree with you, the, the literary world is, you know, maybe on the surface, seems more in the right direction than than other sectors, but I, it does feel really sort of superficial or aesthetic sometimes like you you look at people's publishing lists, and there are all of these, you know, indigenous authors and, and um, trans women and, but there's no representation at like the editorial level, level or the publisher level. And so it's those like decision-making roles that are still predominantly occupied by, by white men. Um, Where are the queer editors? Yeah. Where are the editors of color? Mm -hmm. It's, it's sad because these, these. Where are the Twitter, trans publishers? These Twitter threads <laughs> go around all the time where they're like, um, who are the, the Indigenous publishers in Canada or who are the Indigenous editors in, in Canada and it's the same like five or six people that get tagged every time and yeah. so it, it is disheartening and there's still a, a ton of work to do. Which, which is really a shame because there's a hell of a lot of good Indigenous writing in Canada, a lot, yeah, very strong writing that gets zero attention because everybody just knows five names so like Oh, yeah. I want to I want to reference somebody indigenous, so I'll mention one of the five names that I know. Well, why don't you do some reading and learn some others? Mm -hmm. There are so many amazing anthologies out right now of collections of of queer indigenous work um, that everyone should check out. Love After the End is one of them. Um, if anyone needs a recommendation, thank you. And you're both involved in publishing. And so that kind of segues into what, how do you see your role? And I mean, um, Rona, I know you didn't, you didn't publish, publish this anthology, but you, you edited it, you um, basically, you know, created it, you uh, came up with the idea for it. Maybe you could talk a little bit about your experience in in publishing and the work that you're doing and the work that you maybe you're you're um molly that you're you're looking forward to or uh yeah 
Um, okay, well, um, this is actually the, the, the third anthology I've been involved in creating. Um, the first one, I, um, Naomi Lewis, I was lucky enough to be invited on board with Naomi Lewis, who was putting, out, uh, putting together an anthology called Shy and asked me to join her. And I was uh, very, very excited about that. And we had a great time doing it. The second one, Waiting, um, uh, the idea came to me while I was waiting for the sea train, actually. Um, that's uh, that's uh, our light rapid, rapid transit, Molly, sea train. <laughs> and um, and um, I thought, wow, wouldn't it be great to have like a whole book on just waiting? <laughs> so I, I invited Julie Sedevi, who's another excellent editor on board. And she said, yes. And so that was waiting. Um, the third one, the one, the one that just came out, You Look Good for Your Age, um, that, that came about because um, I, I, was, um, di I got a diagnosis of, of apnea. So I had to see a respiratory um, therapist to, to get fitted uh, you know, with a, I keep wanting to say gas mask, but it's you know, a device. And um, she said, you look good for your age. And I thought, you bitch. And then I thought, what, what? I didn't say that, but I, I didn't inwardly, I didn't like it. And then I just started thinking about that and thinking about it. And I thought, well, why didn't I like it? It was obviously meant as a compliment, you know? And then I realized, no, it's not really a compliment. I mean, it's intended as a compliment, but it seems to, to represent, you know, the way we aging women are seen in society, namely as you're successful if you look younger than you really are. And why is that? Why is it better to look younger? I mean, why don't we uh, in the mainstream culture pay attention to indigenous cultures where they call us older people elders, you know? Because maybe we have some experience under our belt or something, you know? Um, anyway, we don't. So that's what got me going on this one. And um, uh, in, in, in all three cases, it's the University of Alberta Press that I, have worked with, and uh, this is an ex exceptionally, I think, kind of sensitive and responsive publisher. And um, even though it takes, like it takes a long time to get something done through an academic press because there is a very rigorous uh, vetting process involving approximately 3.5 million people doing various levels of review at various points. And, you know, by the time, I mean, I am not young, you know, so by the time you've made your decision, I could be dead, but fortunately I'm not. So, <laughs> so the book came out and I'm really glad because, wow, these, uh, these um, 20 or nine writers really know, know what they're doing. And, um, and yeah, it's been I have representation is very important to me. So I was looking for diversity in um, in, in contributors, and I I, I got it, and um, and also uh, dif different writing in different forms. You know, there's uh, some hybrid pieces. There there there's creative nonfiction. There's fiction. There's some poetry. I think that's my answer. That book sounds amazing. I can't wait to get my hands on it. I can't wait to get my hands on um, Exhibitionist. I'm going to pages tomorrow to get it. Cool. Um, <laughs> Yanni, can you repeat the question? For sure. I'm just wondering, um, as the publisher, as the publisher of Room, uh, what are you looking forward to, or what you mentioned some of the challenges that you see in publishing. But is there anything that you see as a win on the horizon or that um, is a positive? 
so much. Um, so we just put out um, the the fall issue of Room is the Indigenous Brilliance issue, which we printed in full color. It's really sort of art forward. Um, it's gorgeous, and it's our best selling issue in the past. I don't even know four or five years. Um, and I think the best selling issue before that was the queer issue. Um, so I'm just feeling really encouraged and you know no one can tell me that that people don't want to read work by indigenous people because this is like a true testament like just we're almost sold out we printed 2000 copies and they're almost gone um so i'm really excited about that it's full of really beautiful work um that's a, and then lot, of, that's a lot of magazines it's that's lot amazing of magazines. like it's yeah. the industry is is struggling but um this little issue of ours um is powering through um, I and then we've also got a, a partnership coming up with um, Hush Harbor Press. They're a Black queer feminist press out of Toronto. Um, they're new, um, run by Whitney French and Alana Johnson. Um, so we're collaborating with them on a series of um, um, sonic storytelling episodes um, called Speech Sounds. Um, so that will bring in um, people in all aspects of, of the sound art industry, which is like very rich in Canada, but doesn't really have a place on the stage in like literature. Um, so um, we're gonna do some like cross-platform promotion and support them in any way we can, but they've got like the creative control and then we'll just do whatever we can to help. And we'll do, there's like a mentorship component for emerging black sound artists. Um, so keep an eye out for that. That'll probably be um, surfacing, I would say, a year from now. Um, so those are the two big things. But, uh, you know, we were talking sort of about movements before and um, the Black Lives Matter movement that was really had, had sort of um, amped up over uh, the course of the pandemic had us thinking a lot about our practices and our, our commitment to, to Black voices in Canada and Afro-Indigenous um, writers. Um, so that's something that um, we have sort of um, thought about in terms of our mandate. And we started developing this um, anti oppression and copy editing guide that identifies language in literary writing that is like really covert and but really insidious, like these sort of racist tropes that have just worked their way into our sort of idioms and just the way that we speak um, and not just racism, but looking at sexism and homophobia and xenophobia and ableism and fat phobia. Um, so that's something that I'm, I'm really proud of that, that we did in the past year and is a living document that um, future editors can, um, can cross check when they're editing any sort of work that comes through room. Oh, that's all. Um amazing and and th those projects that you mentioned sound really really cool we'll look out for them um right now we're all sitting here on our little screens um because of the ongoing pandemic um and this is something that i've been asking writers now for a year <laughs> how how has it been how how has how are you and um how has the pandemic influenced your writing uh, or has it um yeah go ahead molly i love listening to you oh <laughs> thank you Rod. i love listening to you um <laughs> uh honestly the pandemic has been a little bit soul crushing a little bit um spirit destroying <laughs> i haven't done a ton of writing um but like during the first half of the pandemic i was finishing edits on exhibitionist and that I found okay like as long as I wasn't sort of making something from scratch um, it seemed like I could still produce quite a bit but as soon as it was done like as soon as I sent off the final draft in December I, I was done I haven't written anything since um, I haven't felt any urge to write anything like my creativity feels just gone and I've tried I've, I'm in a workshopping group with some friends and every time it comes around to my turn to submit something I just feel like I'm I'm grasping at straws and it's it's been really difficult so I'm trying to just be patient with myself but there's always that pressure after you release the first book that you have to like keep up the momentum or something and 
So I'm battling myself a little bit with that and trying to just read a lot and hope that, you know, something sparks the the thing again, whatever the thing is, because I've got a like a novel that I would really love to eventually write. It just it just hasn't happened yet. And I'm hoping for something magic, some sort of lightning bolt or something. But for now, I'm just watching TV and reading a lot of YA fantasy. <laughs> There's a lot of good YA fantasy out these days, actually. Um, I'm reading old stuff right now. I'm reading like nostalgic stuff that I, I used to read when I was in middle school. Um, okay, I guess my answer is um, that I am. Um, I think like uh, most other humans, I, I do find this period uh, very weird and often pretty dark. Um, I've always been a slow writer, but now I am a really slow writer, um, like exceptionally slow, even by my own molasses and January standards. And however, I have to say that I think that some something I, I will also say uh, as a sidebar that my editing practice I'm not having trouble with mm -hmm. I, do, I do have an editing practice I edit other people's books and stories and other things that come my way that I think I'm you know where we both think it might be a good match and and that, that that's that's fine um, and you know because they are kind enough to give me something to work with and I don't have to make it up. <laughs> I just, I just have to help them along and that's fine. I can do that. Mm -hmm. But I think um, what's happened to me during this period that, um, that I wasn't expecting um, is that I, like I've always been um, an outspoken person ever since childhood it's always gotten in me into a heap of trouble because, uh, you know, I didn't grow up in a period where girls were supposed to speak their mind, but I did anyway. Um, so I had, a, I had a great family. They, they liked it, you know, but like once you got inside of my immediate family, I was in very deep trouble a lot of the time. However, um, I have always also uh, been uh, extremely um, inclined to question afterwards whether I should have said this or I should have said that or I should have done this or I should have done that because I got reaction A, B, or C when what I really wanted was D, you know? And I really am getting to the point now, I guess, is it because I'm in my dot? dotage? Is it because it's the pandemic? You know, um, uh, I don't know why, but I, I'm kind of getting to the point that I just don't give a damn what anybody else thinks anymore. I really don't. I just think like, well, if they don't like it, I'm sorry. I'm really sorry if you don't like that. I have opinions. I'm, I'm willing to listen to yours. And if you're not willing to listen to mine, then you go off and be happy. You know, somewhere else, we're good. That's kind of where I'm at right now. Uh, and that is a big surprise to me because I have never been there before. I've always really cared what other people thought. And now I don't. I'm gonna keep that one in my back pocket. You go off and be happy <laughs> somewhere <laughs> else. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, my, my mother used to say, I, it's just a variation of what my mother used to say. She used to say, uh, you know, I mean, I would come home and be very upset because somebody had been nasty. And she would look me in the eye and she would say, let them be happy. <laughs> That's very wise. <laughs> very wise. Um, 
I want to open it up to our audience. If anyone has any questions, um, you have a couple minutes to write them below. Um, I, I guess if there are any final thoughts, anything that you want to say, I have to say that this was a fantastic um, evening for me. I really enjoyed your writing and your readings. I um, laughed out loud while I was reading your work, both of you. So I, I really um, appreciate that. And audience, if you don't already have these books, you must go out and get them. So these, this is You Look Good for Your Age by Rona, Rona Altros and also A Run on Hose by Rona and Exhibitionist by Molly Cross Blanchard. So local bookstores um, are carrying them. So, oh, here we have a question or, or something. Ah. Amy says, uh, thank you both so, so much for your readings and your insights. You're both brilliant. And this was a bright spot in my week. And I think that we can all agree with Amy. So, so I want to thank you both again. And um, hopefully- This has been great. <laughs> it's just been so great. I don't, usually, I don't usually like Zoom things. They're stressful, you know? But this has just been- Super. Yeah. I kind of do really feel like we've all been together in a way, you know? I hope we get to be together for real sometime soon. Yes. Yes, please. Hey, let's read together, Molly, like in person. Yeah. I think, I think we're a good team, actually. I think, I think so. Compliment each other. <laughs> right. well, so. I agree. And I can say that um, Flywheel would be thrilled to host you in person in in hopefully the the near future so, all right thank you. um so yeah lots of kudos coming in so thank you both and um just an, a a note um next month we have um marcello de cintio and sarah borgone um reading so um excited to have those two uh coming up and um we will be online until the end of the year and then in 2020 2022 already 2022 holy moly um we don't know what's happening so but we'll we'll let you know so uh have a wonderful evening everyone and share the um the facebook um post with your friends and i hope that you are all safe and sound so Thank you so much. Bye. Good night, everyone. Bye.